Hey guys and welcome back, or if you're new around here, hi, my name's Georgia and I'm a platform on the internet, I talk about true crime. And today I have a very exciting case updates episode for you. I'm sure we all know what these episodes are by now, but just in case you're new around here, every few months I film a case updates episode in which I update you on all the latest news in the world of true crime and keep you up to date on the latest movements and cases I've previously covered. It's kind of a way to keep accountability for both myself as a creator and you guys as active viewers. Plus, it's always just nice to know the latest goings-ons. Goings-on? Going-ons. I don't... I said that wrong. It felt wrong. Today I've got some very unexpected updates, some suspects in unsolved serial killer cases, some dough identifications, and just some general news. So without any further ado, let's just jump into it. First up, I'm going to start with some very sad news in a case I actually covered pretty recently. Towards the end of last year, I spoke about the story of the so-called tent girl who was unidentified, forgotten for many, many years until a man called Todd Matthews decided to dedicate his entire life to getting her name back and he succeeded. He found out that she was Barbara Hackman Taylor. And Todd went on to help develop a site that we all know and love, I use it all the time, Doe Network. Todd was a truly amazing person who fought for the nameless tirelessly for so many years and I'm very sad to say that in early January of this year, Todd passed away. He was only in his 50s so he was incredibly young and we don't have many details of his passing but we don't really need to know, we just need to remember his legacy. Doe Network have put up a lovely dedication to him on their website, which I do want to read out because I just think it's the best way to honour him. They knew him over at Doe Network, they knew what an incredible man he was, so let's use their words. Todd Matthews, where to begin? Todd was one who wouldn't take no for an answer. He heard the story of Tent Girl and decided that he would be the one to find her identity, and miraculously, after so much effort, he did. That was the beginning of a lifelong fascination for Todd for solving missing and unidentified persons cases. He was truly the original amateur sleuth. So many countless people are profoundly grateful they had the opportunity to know and work with such an amazing man. Todd was a genuine person. What you saw was what you got. He was so funny, kind, inspirational, magnetic and extremely helpful. He had a way of making you feel special and important every time you talked to him. He was the kind of person who was willing to get up in the middle of the night and work at a frenzied pace to help a stranger. He is our founder and our mentor and his work with the Doe Network will never be forgotten. He left an indelible mark that will live on through the community of volunteers who will honour his commitment to those who are missing or unidentified. May he rest in peace. It is a very sad note to start this episode on, but without Todd, there would be so many people out there who are still unidentified. So many families who are still out in search of their loved ones. He has this incredible legacy that needs to be remembered, so I really wanted to just take a moment here to talk about him. Next up, let's talk about some huge news in a couple of unidentified serial killer cases, the Redhead murders and the Colonial Parkway murders, and we'll start with the latter. In January of this year, a man was named a suspect in two of the Colonial Parkway deaths. Alan W. Wilmer Sr. was a small-time fisherman who died back in 2017. He was 63 years old when he died in Lancaster County in Virginia, and authorities have confirmed that if he were still alive, charges would be filed against him for not just two homicides, but three. In 1987, 29-year-old David Nobling and 14-year-old Robin Edwards were murdered in Isle of Wight County, last seen alive on September 19th. David's pickup truck was found abandoned in a car park the next day on Ragged Island. The keys were still in the ignition, the radio and windshield wipers were still on, it was kind of as if they'd been directly grabbed out of the truck and just abducted. Their bodies were found four days later along the shoreline of Ragged Island. They had both been shot and Robin had been sexually assaulted. And they were just two of at least eight murders that took place along the Colonial Parkway in Virginia from 1986 to 1989. Thanks to the close vicinity, it's always been assumed that all the deaths were the work of the same person or same people, but Wilma has only been announced as a suspect in the deaths of David and Robin. He was also identified as a suspect in the unrelated murder of 29-year-old Teresa Lynn Spore Howell in the city of Hampton. She was last seen alive on July 1st, 1989 at around 2.30am leaving the Zodiac Club. 
Later that day, her body was found in nearby woodland and she died as a result of strangulation and had been sexually assaulted. Teresa's murder was never linked to the Colonial Parkway murders thanks to the fact that it didn't happen on the Colonial Parkway, but it was in the same general area. Wilma has been conclusively linked to the three deaths through DNA after authorities just went back through some old cases with a fine-toothed comb. Now, most sources aren't entirely clear as to how exactly they were able to reach Wilma as a suspect, because whilst they did have DNA in both cases, he had no felonies and therefore his DNA was not in any databases to match to. It seems they came to him after they identified several potential suspects, and a couple of years ago, the Virginia Department of Forensic Science did identify that they were dealing with a common suspect in Teresa's and David and Robin's murder. So they knew through this matching DNA that it was the same person who killed all three people, but because Wilma's DNA wasn't in the system, they had to go out and find him. The articles just read that in a fresh probe of the cases, they somehow came to Wilma as a suspect, and when they learned he was dead, they legally obtained his genetic material. The forensic science department compared his DNA to the evidence DNA found, and boom, in June 2023, they got a match. As I said, if he was still alive today, they would have immediately arrested him in connection with these murders. And seeing as no trial has taken place, I don't think we can say with 100% certainty that he was definitely responsible. I'm not really sure the legalities of innocent until proven guilty after somebody's death. Maybe I should research that. But we can say with certainty that his DNA was found at both scenes, and that seems like an awfully big coincidence. So whilst he has not been on trial, he, his DNA was there. His DNA was definitely there. Whilst Wilma has been linked to two of the Colonial Parkway deaths, he has not been able to be linked to any of the others through said DNA, although it does seem investigators are very much still looking into this. I don't know if DNA evidence was found in the other cases, I don't know if there's even anything to compare to, that answer's just not out there. But for now, authorities are asking for anyone to come forward with any information they have about Alan Wilma. They've shared some details about him. He was five foot five, he was about 165 pounds and had sandy brown hair and blue eyes, and he'd often wear a close cropped beard. He drove a distinctive blue 1966 Dodge Fargo pickup truck with a Virginia license plate EMRAW. Although this was just one of the many trucks that he would drive around in the late 80s and early 90s. He also had a small commercial fishing boat called the Denny Wade. It was a 1976 custom built wooden boat that he would dock at marinas in Gloucester and Middlesex and around the Northern Neck. He worked as a fisherman throughout the 1980s, farming mostly clams and oysters, and he also ran a business called Better Tree Service, which I can only assume had something to do with trees or landscaping. He was also an avid hunter and belonged to at least one club in the Middle Peninsula area. Authorities are urging anyone who knew Wilma in literally any capacity to contact the FBI by calling 1-800-CALL-FBI or you can submit a tip online at www.tips.fbi.gov. Anonymous tips are, of course, very welcome. They're hoping that over the years, loyalties have changed. People who may not have spoken up about something suspicious at the time in the 80s might see things in a different light now in 2024, 30 years down the line. If you know anything, even if you just knew him very briefly in life, please get in contact with the FBI. This is something I'm going to be keeping a very close eye on as we go forward. I'll be very intrigued to see if they can link him to any of the other deaths, or maybe all the Colonial Parkway murders were just coincidence. Maybe different people are responsible for all of them. Moving on, let's talk about an update in the Redhead murders. I had so many of you leave comments on my original video to let me know that this case has been solved. But honestly, it all seems a bit up in the air. I really don't think it's been categorically solved as the headlines like to make you think. But I figured I might as well share this small update with you anyway. The Redhead murder case refers to a series of unsolved homicides of redheaded women in the US between 1978 and 1992 through a number of states. Most of the victims were believed to be in hitchhiking or engaged in sex work at the time of their deaths. The five victims who are most often linked to this so-called redheaded murderer were Lisa Nichols, Tina Farmer, Tracy Walker, Michelle Inman, and Espy Pilgrim. In my original video on this, I spoke about a man called Jerry Johns as a suspect. He'd been convicted in 1987 for kidnapping and assaulting a woman called Linda Shack. 
and despite a terrible ordeal, she was somehow able to survive and put her attacker behind bars. But just two months beforehand, Tina Farmer had been killed under very similar circumstances. There was no forensic evidence at the time to connect him, it was all only circumstantial. But then in 2019, DNA came through and identified him as definitely being responsible for Tina's death as well. A grand jury ruled that if Johns was still alive, he died in prison in 2015, he would have been indicted for her murder. So we kind of have known for a while that at the very least, Johns is responsible for at least one of the redheaded murders. But in January this year, it was announced in a podcast called Murder 101 that the case had been cracked. But not as all as it seems. The podcast is kind of a continuation of a school project thought up in 2018 by sociology teacher Alice Campbell at Elizabeth High School in I think Tennessee, I didn't actually write that in my notes but I'm sure it was Tennessee. It's a school that's in close proximity to multiple of these murders. In their sociology class they analysed this case that actually wasn't all that well known at this point and they saw a pattern in the killings and they even helped to identify one of the victims, Tina McKenney Farmer. Tina's DNA was then able to be linked to Jerry John, so basically they were responsible for Jerry John's being identified as Tina's murderer and for Tina having a name. That's really, really cool. And this school project has continued into this year with the students now diving into the world of true crime podcasting with a 10 episode Murder 101. And they believe after pouring through the case files and talking to former detectives, that there is very strong evidence to prove that whoever killed Tina was also very likely to have killed the rest of the victims. However, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation has told people that whilst the investigation into the rest of the murders does remain active and ongoing, there's no actual evidence to indicate that Jerry Johns is responsible for the death of Elizabeth Lamott or Tracy Walker. Michelle Inman was only very recently identified, so at this point investigators are still pursuing leads into her death and gathering information, so in her case they can't really say either way. So yeah, whilst the students' work and podcast makes for really great headlines, and whilst they did genuinely help identify Tina and Jerry Johns as a suspect, I don't think it can be definitively said that he was responsible for all the murders until the authorities announced the same. Regardless, they have been doing really incredible work and I hope they don't stop anytime soon. They're just hoping that the podcast will bring as much attention to this case as possible and maybe help identify further victims. The students said they felt like the women didn't have anyone to speak for them and that's why they got forgotten. So they wanted to be their voice and in the process they got attached. They actually refer to the women as their six sisters, which is just so lovely. And in my opinion, it just really displays the best of humanity. I really love it. Just people helping people. So yeah, I do think the headlines saying this case has been solved are a bit premature. I don't think this case has been solved until the authorities confirm that it's been solved. But there's definitely movement in it. Things are happening. Next up, I have a potential update in the Amelia Earhart case. And this is really, really interesting, but it's kind of only half-baked at this point. We're waiting on a little bit more information, but I figured I would share it with you and we will follow it all the way through to the end. In January of this year, it was reported that 87 years after Amelia's mysterious disappearance, her plane was finally found. Now, I'm sure all of us already know the story of Amelia Earhart, but just in case some of you don't, she was an American aviation pioneer and just this all-round incredible woman. She was chasing after her dreams in a world which wasn't all that friendly to women, you know, having ambition. She became the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean, but her biggest goal was to become the first female pilot to circumnavigate the entire world. But during her attempt on July 2nd, 1937, she disappeared over the Pacific Ocean. No trace of her or her plane has ever been found, despite the most expansive and expensive rescue operation in the history of the US Navy and the Coast Guard. She just vanished, becoming one of America's greatest enduring mysteries, and so many people have attempted to solve it to find her, and nobody succeeded. But there's this guy called Tony Romeo, he's a former Air Force intelligence officer and is now CEO of a company called Deep Sea Vision. In 2023, he was able to fund a deep sea search of the Pacific, specifically in search of Amelia Earhart's plane. In August last year, they began scanning the ocean floor with a very powerful sonar attached to a $9 million submersible. They scanned more than 5,200 square miles in the general area where it's thought the plane must have gone down and took 
thousands of images in this time. Thanks to a corrupted computer file though, the data wasn't fully reviewed until December, which point they found an image of a blurry plane-like shape taken 100 miles from Howland Island, which was Amelia's next refueling stop when she vanished. Now the images are very blurry, their sonar being taken five miles under the sea, so it's not going to be completely clear, but I must admit the images do look plain shaped and they were apparently taken in a very sort of sandy and flat area where there shouldn't be anything in a plain shape. Tony Romeo went on to NBC's Today Show and said, you'd be hard pressed to convince me that's anything but an aircraft for one and two, that it's not Amelia's aircraft. He points out there's no other known crashes in this area and it doesn't look like a modern day plane. However, he did go on to say the images could be of rocks or some other underwater object. So he can't be convinced it's anything other than Amelia's plane, but it could also be rocks. By the time they found this image on the corrupted hard drive, the search had moved away from this area. So Deep Sea Vision have simply said they're gonna have to return to it at some point and just confirm their potential findings. But other experts in the field have said categorically that it's definitely not Amelia's plane. There are so many theories to what happened to Amelia and nobody knows for sure. There's theories that she landed on other islands in the Pacific, maybe Gardner Island, maybe Nicomororo Island. There were human remains found on the latter in 1940 and in 2018 an anthropology professor at the University of Tennessee studied these remains and he declared they were likely Amelia's but I don't think that's a solid conclusion though because it's nothing forensic. So for now the potential plane image joins the swathes of other unanswered questions in this case at least until deep sea vision get back there and confirm or deny their findings. The original expedition cost them 11 million dollars though so they probably do have some more fundraising to do before they can get back there so Again, wait and see. And with that, the rest of the updates I have for you are all either identifications or some more information in some Jane Doe cases, which is just news that I absolutely love to share with you. We all know there's nothing more I love in the true crime space than people getting reunited with their identities. It just warms my heart every time because the most basic things we have as humans are our names, our identities, our loves and hates, our personalities. That is the very least we can give somebody when we bury them, their name. We're going to start with the final Gary Ridgeway, the Green River Killer victims being identified, or at least the final victims that have been attributed to him as of today. Ridgway was convicted of murdering 49 women and girls throughout the 80s and 90s, although it's very much believed that that was just the tip of the iceberg. It's thought he actually killed 90 plus people in his years as an active serial killer. Although Ridgway was a suspect in the Green River killing since 1983, he wasn't formally arrested for the crimes until November 2001, after DNA conclusively linked him to four women's deaths from 20 years earlier. Let that be known to all criminals, all rapists and murderers. DNA is always going to get you eventually, especially today. Your time, it's very much numbered. But this isn't about Ridgway. This is about the identification of two of his victims, the final two victims in this case without their names. In December 2023, it was announced that the victim who had been known as Bone 17 for almost four decades was officially Laurie Ann Rasputnik, after being identified by Parabon Nanolabs through forensic genetic genealogy. In 1982, 15-year-old Laurie ran away from a family home in Lewis County for reasons unknown, and they never saw her again. Unknown to them, on December 30th, 1985, her remains were found over an embankment in Auburn, a city about 25 miles south of Seattle, and she was found with another set of remains as well. With no ID found with either set of remains, they became known as Bone 16 and Bone 17, with Laurie being 17. In 2002, Ridgway led investigators to this spot and said that he'd placed victims there, so it became known at this point that they were definitely Green River Killer victims. And then in 2012, Bone 16 were identified as Sandra Majors, but it would take another 11 years before Laurie was identified. Parabon Nanolabs were the ones contracted to find her identity and they were able to eventually get a DNA profile. They eventually came to the name of Laurie Ann Rasputnik, at which point they contacted her parents and got her mother, Donna Hurley, to provide a saliva sample and that confirmed the match. 
Donna told the Times that she always speculated that Laurie could have been a Ridgeway victim, but it doesn't look like she ever spoke to the authorities about this or really spoke to anyone about this, although I may well be wrong. She said it was just easier to go on with her life, thinking her daughter was alive and well somewhere, raising her own family, which I can totally, totally understand. And with that, we move on to the final unidentified Ridgeway victim, a woman who was known for almost 39 years as just Bones 20. In April 1985, the remains of two unidentified women were found near the Tua Latin Golf Course in Tigard in Oregon. In 1988, dental records were able to identify one of the women as Tammy Lillies and the other as Angela Gardner. And almost immediately, they were assumed to be the victims of the mysterious Green River Killer. But as we know, he wouldn't be apprehended did for many, many years. Fast forward to 2002, 2003, when Ridgway has now been arrested and is being interviewed in depth about many of his crimes. But he actually denied any responsibility for Tammy and Angela's murder. He would confess to so many, but those two he said he didn't do. But he actually did confess to two other victims that were found in a very similar area later in 1985, and that was Denise Bush and Shirley Sherrill. And then, late in 2003, Ridgway led investigators to an area near Kent Des Moines Road in South King County, Washington, and sure enough, after a search, partial skeletal remains were found. Now, no skull was found and most of the major bones were absent, but there were a significant amount of remains there. This evidence was sent to the University of North Texas where a DNA profile was obtained and uploaded to NDIS, a national DNA database that had the profile of missing people and unidentified remains. But at the time, there was no match. So the remains became known as Bones 20, which is what they would be called for many, many years. There were plenty of attempts made over the years to identify these remains, but nothing worked until autumn 2022, when the Kings County Sheriff's Office met with Othram to discuss what they could do. And I have raved about Othram so many times online, they're on a mission to provide justice for all through breaking forensic DNA barriers and using forensic grade genome sequencing. And it was exactly that that they used to find the victim's identity after managing to develop a DNA extract from the remains, something that nobody else had been able to do. In August 2023, Othram were able to tell King County that they had tentatively identified Bones 20 as Tammy Lillies, who, as I said, had already been identified as a victim in 1988 after quite a lot of her remains were found in 1985. So to confirm all this, a relative of Tammy's was contacted to obtain some DNA that they could use for a direct comparison, and it was concluded that this was 100% Tammy, it was the rest of her remains. Her family have asked for privacy in this time, so they haven't done any interviews or spoken out at all. I suppose they've had a very long time to come to terms with Tammy's death since 1988, but I'm sure this latest revelation has brought up a whole load of emotions for them. Like the thought of your loved one's remains being found in itself is horrible, but then being scattered across two states? No, who does that? Why? The crimes of Gary Ridgway just continue to get worse with every detail you find out. But with the identity of Tammy, of Bones 20, that puts a lid on one of the chapters of the Green River Killer. Every known victim of his has now been reunited with their name, with their identity. And it sounds like such a small thing, but it's so important. Don't think this is the end of Ridgway's case though, because even though he is in prison and everyone has been identified now, there are still unsolved cases out there that could be connected to him. There are still families out there looking for answers as to their dead or missing loved ones. This investigation is far from being over. It is constantly being looked at. According to a USA Today article from December, there are three more women who are thought to be potential victims of Ridgeway. That's Cassie Ann Lee, Kelly K. McGuinness, and Patricia Ann Osborne. They all went missing from the Seattle area in the 1980s, and they remain missing to this day. So the search, like I said, is very much still active. Our next Jane Doe to be identified, not a Ridgeway victim, thankfully, was the woman formerly known as Lorraine Stuhl. Her case is one which has fascinated me ever since I covered it just over a year ago now, I think. And it's one that I kept checking back in on again and again. And I was just overjoyed when I found out that she had been identified. In May 1974, Connecticut State Police found decomposed remains in a wooded area in Ledyard, Connecticut, after receiving a tip about two murders at a home on Shoeville Road. Sure enough, they found two shallow graves, one set of female remains and one set of male. 
The male was quickly identified as Gustavus Lee Carmichael. He was a convicted bank robber who had escaped from custody, but there was no clue as to his female companion's identity. The pair had been in the area for a while. They were known to use the aliases of Dirk and Lorraine Stahl. That's how everyone around knew them. But it quickly turned out that they had stolen these identities. No one had any clue as to Lorraine's real name, but investigators were able to find out their killers. Richard DeFratis and Donald Brandt were convicted of their murders. But then we jump forward to 2022. Connecticut are working on getting through their backlog of cold cases, and in doing so, they submit evidence in Lorraine's case to the aforementioned Othram, who were soon able to extract some DNA and form a comprehensive DNA profile, which they use to connect with distant family members and start to build out a family tree. And that eventually led them to the sister of Linda Sue Childers. The sister was a direct match. Investigators believe that Linda was killed on December 31st, 1970, making her around 24 years old when she died. Linda was originally from Louisville in Kentucky and it's said that her daughter and sister were both notified of her identification. So she did have family, although we don't know the situation around it. That's about all the information we have in her case. Like I always say, the family aren't entitled to have to share loads of information about it. Sometimes just the name is enough. And to round up this updates episode, I just have a couple of updates and some other doe cases that you guys have brought to my attention. Not identifications, but just small updates. If you ever see an update in any case, no matter how small it is, like I want to hear about it. Just go back to the original video and leave a comment. I do try and read as many of my comments as possible, so chances are I will see it and I'll add it to my updates list. I find out so much information that way because whilst I do try my best to stay updated myself, understandably that's a lot of cases to keep on top of all of my ones like you guys are the heroes like every time you comment something it's so helpful to me but anyway one of you guys alerted me to some new information on the wikipedia page of mary anderson a woman who checked into a hotel in seattle washington under a pseudonym in october 1996 and there she ended her own life Despite extensive investigation to identify her she still remains unnamed or just named the wrong name her case is also one that's been taken up by Othram. They put her case up for public funding in 2022, I think, and it received that funding very quickly, but they still don't have an identity. However, on the 10th of November last year, 2023, Othram published an update stating that their advanced DNA testing suggested a Middle Eastern background for Mary. Testing suggests that her biogeographical origins trace back to eastern Iran or Afghanistan, possibly with a Persian background. Clearly, Othram are actively working on this case, so I have no doubt that Mary is going to get answers soon. Othram, like I said, they're truly amazing. They always are able to get those answers. But whether or not it's released to the public, though, at its conclusion is another thing entirely. This was a woman who clearly didn't want to be identified when she left this world. She went to great efforts to hide her true identity. Whilst in cases like this, I do believe the family should be given closure and I believe the authorities should have the proper information. I don't know how I feel about the public knowing that information. But if the family decide to release it, then I don't know. Life is for the living, I suppose, not for the dead. I explore this sort of like train of thought in much more detail in my old video on the Christmas tree lady. And I do explore it a little bit in my original video on Mary. So I'll link them both down below if you want to hear more thoughts around that. It's, it's a really interesting ethical conundrum. I would be really interested to hear your thoughts about this in the comments. Like, do you think that when somebody dies and goes to an effort to hide their identity... Do you think we should put any effort into identifying them? Like, is that something we should be using our time and resources on? Like, is it for the family that we do it? Is it for the authorities so they can have the correct information? Or do we just, do we accept their wishes? It's really interesting. There's no right or wrong answer. And finally, I want to end on quite a quick update in Julie Doe's case. I only covered her story in October last year, but in December, DNA Doe Project made it their featured case of their month, and they shared some more information that I figured I could share. She's thought to be transgender for many reasons, but was also pointed out multiple times in the comments of my original video that she could have been intersex, or maybe she had androgen insensitivity syndrome, when a person who is genetically male is resistant to hormones that produce a male experience. For reasons I explored in the original episode, I do very much lean towards her being transgender, but I did also want to throw that possibility out there as well, just, just for more information. 
But anyway, the details of Julie Doe's case, the DNA Doe Project chose to share, some of which we did already know, were that she was found in September 1988 near Orlando, Florida, but she likely lived in South Florida. She had breast implants that were manufactured prior to 1985, and she had multiple past fractures, including of her cheek, nose, and ribs. She lived a life of great violence, it seems. They also threw out some surnames of interest, names that I will guess have been appearing in distant genealogical matches. These are Anaya, Thornton, Robinson, and Hurt. If you have family history in Florida with any of those names, then it could be worth getting in contact with DNA Doe Project, where you can submit your GEDmatch kit number for easy comparison, if you have your DNA in GEDmatch, that is. They posted in the comments that throughout December, 75 people made submissions and three of them were distant matches. So you never know how your DNA could help in this case, in any case. If you recognize Julie Doe or just want to submit a lead to the team, you can email case-tips at dnadoeproject.org. It's happened so many times that I cover a case on YouTube and then like two months later, DNA Doe Project features it as their like case of the month. And I can't help but feel like we are we're like this, like, are they following me? Is it coincidence? I don't know. I see you, DNA Doe Project. I'm following you. I literally am. I, I think they're incredible. <laughs> so there you go. They are all the updates I have for you as of today, April 3rd, 2024. Going forward, if you hear of any update in any case I've ever covered, no matter how small, please go and find that original video, comment on it, or comment on this video. Actually, you know what? Leave a comment anyway. Comments are so unbelievably helpful for YouTubers. It tells YouTube that people are engaging with my content, they like what they're seeing, they're taking the time to write a comment, and therefore YouTube push out further to more people, because they're like, oh, if these people liked it, then maybe more people might like it as well. So leave a comment, like, subscribe if you're not subscribed. If you're feeling really generous, you can join my channel memberships for just £2.99 a month. It's a blast. Um, thank you so much for tuning in today and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.